thank you, Lori, for talking with me today. I'm so excited to jump into this and talk to you about your experience as a VTS in ClinPath because as we talked about just now in the club or in the coffee house, we have lots of questions come up about what it takes to become a VTS in ClinPath, you know, the, what you, you know, how you even start. Um, and so I'm just so excited to have you here to talk to me and to everybody about, <laughs> about, about all that, about your experience getting into this, what you're doing now. Um, so yeah, if you don't mind just kind of starting us at the beginning and, um, you know, telling us how did you, how, you know, you started as a veterinary technician. I mean, you are a veterinary technician, but you, did you start just in general practice? Well, backing up from that, I started, I went to college and I have my um, bachelor's in biology and minored in chemistry and then worked in the private sector and then took some time off to raise my children. And then I started working at a, it was a large animal practice, but it was only like one to three doctors depending. And I did a little bit of everything there. And during that time, I was there for about eight years, but during that time I went and I got my v, uh, CVT. And then after there, then I landed at Quakertown Vet, which ironically is exactly where I started when I graduated from college. So nice. talk about coming full circle. Cause when I graduated from college, I did uh, develop their um, forage analysis lab. So I, you know, the, the route was not a straight route, in other words. So I started in the allergy lab here, and then the next year I moved into the main lab. So doing the main lab and the allergy lab. And then in 2015, actually in 2013, I started the process, the application and getting everything ready uh, for the VTS. And then in 2015, I also took over the lab and then I and then I earned my VTS uh, in clinical pathology. So it wasn't a straight route by any means, but the CBT, uh, the VTS in ClinPath is a fairly new specialty. So 2014 was the first year they offered the test. So it, it's small because uh, for some reason, a lot of techs don't want to spend time in the lab. I don't understand why, but they just don't like it. So yeah. for me, I spend, I was the first dedicated lab tech in at Quakertown. And now we've got, I want you, two, three other full-timers and then um, two part-timers. So nice. we've grown. And then we also man the lab Monday through, you know, just seven days a week. We yeah. don't do overnights. But the other technicians that are overnight can do the basic stuff in the lab. But we do a lot of the cool stuff. Uh, so because we're so large, we have over 45 doctors at this practice. Wow. And it's large animal, small animal, exotics. Uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff to be done. We do send um, histo out. We send some uh, cytology out. But for the most part, you know, 90% is, is done in-house. So that's sort of cool. We're also a DEP certified lab and a USDA certified Coggins lab. So there's always something to do here, always. And we never close. Blizzards, COVIDs, we just don't close. So we are always busy. That's, that's incredible. I didn't realize that was such a large lab um, and that you had, or that it was such a large practice. So how is the lab incorporated with the practice? Do you have your own space like I mean obviously you have your own like layout that how does the hospital layout look I'm just curious um the the hospital layout I call it a human habit trail because it started small it started at a as a large animal mainly bovine practice and then bit by bit added on so the lab was actually built in 1984 and I was one of the first people working in there but it was really empty at that point. So over the years, it has grown. We have three bays. We have, you know, the CBC, the chemistry, the emulate, all these different machines. And now the place is, is full. Um, we haven't quite outgrown it yet. We've been trying to really utilize the space we have. 
um, but it is dedicated lab space. So that's it works awesome. out pretty and well. So you get to just stay in the lab all day and I stay in that. In the, yeah, it's safer in there. It really is. <laughs> um, and it's, it's quieter, uh, but you're preaching, yeah, you're preaching to the, the choir. I mean, I, I love the lab. I go in and I'm like <laughs> my safe zone. Yeah. I'll get to go. And I don't anymore, but you know, work in a practice where there's a, I worked in a specialty practice. And then when I was in my residency, it was, you know, I would, I mean, I love animals still. I imagine you still love animals, but we get to go yeah. out and interact with the animals and then go back to our safe lab and you know hear the machines buzzing and <laughs> it's a nice uh calming space in my opinion well it is and if i don't hear a machine buzzing like if it's too quiet i'm like okay what's wrong with the machine You're right <laughs> there has to you be know there, there's something wrong and at this place uh we do not take the samples all the samples are brought to us nice. so we literally stay in the lab and they bring us all the blood urine fecals whatever we're doing and we we just Run stay there and process it that's great i mean so it really and, is know, it's a fully functioning people, lab oh yes absolutely yeah. and you know some people may think that it it might get boring but every day is different there are days where you look at five urines and there's nothing in them and then all of a sudden you get one that has a ton of transitional cells and you're looking at it thinking oh there is a huge problem with this animal and we have a lot of, um, we see a lot of emergencies. So, you know, we have some really interesting cases coming in. And it, you know, as far as the lab work, okay, it's not good for the animal, but it does make life, you know, very interesting. And there's some really good teaching cases as far as what's going on. And we recently got a, a new microscope that has a camera on top. So we've had a lot of fun with that because I now bet. rather than everybody crowding around the scope, we can just simply turn that on and be like, okay, this is what we're seeing. And then when the doctors come in, you know, we, if we want, we can show them what's going on. And then yeah. we also have an extra scope just for them too. So it's, it's the same, but it's different every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally, you're, you're speaking my language. Cause that's how I feel. <laughs> I mean, even the, you know, when I'm going through cases and even the ones that are, you know, quote unquote boring, just because you see them a lot, like I, I don't get tired of a mast cell tumor. I'm like, hey, number one, it's beautiful. And two, it's quick. So I can <laughs> move through my cases. And then you get ones that are more challenging and that you get to stop and really think about, look things up and things you haven't seen before. And um, that's one of the cool things about lab medicine is it's, it's, it, it's like, varied enough to keep things really interesting, but also, you know, not if, if it was challenging all the time, then it would be well, probably a little frustrating, but you know, if you're, if you're uh, getting a nice mix, that's awesome. And you're doing, you said it was it it's mostly the, small animal. No, we're, we're small animal. And I will say most of the doctors, maybe out of the 40, about 30 are 30, 35 are small animal, but okay. we've got 10 large animal and okay. some of those small animal are exotics. So you know, we've seen everything from llamas and elephants, uh, the zoo was in town, um, you know, to dogs, cats, guinea pigs, rabbits, uh, you, you know, almost everything. We've seen it in one form or another. Yeah. So there's a lot of opportunity to learn stuff and then yeah. a lot of opportunity to teach. And then the other thing I do, just because I'm not busy enough, is I teach the ClinPath class for, um, there's a veterinary technician program at one of the local colleges. So I teach there. So it's nice to be able to bring some of the stuff in that I've had here. So for instance, I have a quart of horse urine that, you know, one <laughs> of the questions is why is horse urine cloudy? Well, it's calcium carbonate crystals and there's mucus. So Right. I have this quart of horse urine that I'm dying to take into my class because when you 
pull that pipe pet up, you just see these strands of your of <laughs> and you think that must like, be wrong, cool? something wrong with it. Yeah, no, it's I love that. Normal variation can be so interesting in itself, just from species to species. That's so neat. I love that you guys get such a varied caseload. I mean, I'm you've got your hematometer out, I'm sure, and all the all the different things for all the different species. That's that's really cool. Um yeah. so you said that you I'm curious about, and this is what, what technicians ask a lot about, is what the process to specializing um, in, at, like as a vet tech in clinical pathology entails. And I've personally been on the website for the, um, the things that you guys have to go through, which it seems like a ton of stuff. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I think, and so I don't know all the details and I'd love for you to kind of get into that a little bit more for people. Um, sure. But in, also I noticed that there's a, a large uh, experience component to it. And, um, and I'll have a second follow-up question with that, but what, what are the steps that, you know, once you decided I wanted to go into ClinPath um, specifically, what did you then have to do? So the first thing is, you know, certainly going to the website and checking out what are the requirements. So there is a component of experience and it's about 3000 hours. So for me, I'm working in the lab 100% of the time. So it's not hard to get that. But if you're working 50% of the time or 25% of the time, part of, part of that is making sure that you have enough experience to know what you're looking at, know what you're doing. And then there's a certain amount of CE that has to be completed that is specifically for clinical pathology. Now there's a range there because sometimes you can get CE that is labeled you know, clinical pathology and you're doing cytology work. Other times it might be talking about renal issues in the cat and they're gonna be doing the laboratory component and how those laboratory values will affect the cat. So that can count too. And certainly in the age of COVID, rather than having most of it in person, you know, we're allowed, um, you know, CE that's virtual. So getting those, making sure that you have met those prerequisites. And there's things like getting a uh, letter of recommendation. So th those are your basics. And then it is things like you have to submit uh, I think it's up to 75 CBCs that you have done. Um, I think it's 50 chemistries, 50 urines, and then, and, and the, the corresponding paperwork needs to be filled out. So for all of that, you know, part of the issue is you, you need to be organized. You need to follow the directions. You need to fill out the forms that, that they want. You just can't, you know, write it on a piece of paper and submit it that way. Then after that, there's about mm, 75, is it 75? There's, there's a, uh, a list of other tests that you need to do. So they give you options. So for instance, if you do use the hemocytometer in your, in your work, that would count for one of the tests that's there. And then they divide them between extra hematology tests, fecal tests, micro tests. Um, there's even a section for other. So those all have to be documented and done and signed off on by either a vet or another VTS. So you need to prove that you've done everything. And I want to say it's not hard. It is time consuming and you need to be organized and document everything. So once all that is ready to go, then you also have three case reports that need to be done. So these case reports, the idea is to follow the animal from start to finish. So the animal comes in knowing what history is taken, take the sample, you know, have you done all the QC on the instruments? And then also writing up a case report afterwards. So how does what you're doing, whether it's the QC part of it, running the machines, the results, how does all that put together and affect the results and the corresponding diagnosis that the doctor will make? So that's the other component. And then that application is submitted. Then that application is reviewed and you, you can submit extra stuff. So if you goof somewhere and, and one is thrown out, you have extra in there. So the application is reviewed. 
and we have like three, four, five people reviewing it so that we all come to a consensus. It's not one person saying, oh, this, you know, I don't like this, um, but they are looked at, you know, like we look at them all. And then if the application is accepted, then from there, you have to take the exam. And just this past year, because of COVID, we had the exam uh, done at a location close to the candidates' houses. So in previous years, we had it at a um, conference down in Kentucky. So this year it was done um, at the different locations by a proctor. And then the, app, then, then the exam is graded. So part of it is um, you know, hands-on stuff. And then part of it is a written. So it's graded and then you know, pass fail type of thing after that. That's yeah, that sounds like and it, it's it sounds like one of those things that like I mean for us too as veterinarians wanting to go into pathology, you know, all the steps that you have to take to, you know, apply for residency. Now this this is different the way that this is arranged um, sure. and set up, but you know, going through residency and then and then studying for the board exam, like it's not for the weak of heart. It's not just for the people that, you know, say, I kind of like, you know, running CBCs, it's uh, you're, you are seriously invested in that as your career. And, you know, it doesn't mean that if you don't, aren't interested in that, it's, you know, it's bad. I mean, that's just not for you. But if, you know, if you're wanting to go into this, you really, there's a lot of steps to take, which are time consuming. But if that's what you really want to do at the end of it, then the people that are really, really invested in that as their, you know, future career goal are, are going to go through those steps. Um, it, it is yeah. not for the faint of heart. You, <laughs> you have to want it um, mm -hmm. deep down inside. Because I will say that when I first started, the, um, the adjectives in front of the word application changed. For, so first it was this, this amazing, this wonderful application process. And then, you know, by the end, there might have been some other adjectives in front of that word <laughs> application because it's it is a lot of work mm -hmm. and but I learned so much like I will say I thought I knew a fair amount going into that but I learned so much just studying submitting everything finding out all the details about you know why you're doing what test or how the test works mm -hmm. it was an amazing amount of information but I Overall, I really did like it. And I, yeah. I uh, it was a great, it was an interesting process and I learned a ton. So yeah, yeah it's not awesome. for the faint of heart, but if you like lab work, it's, it's doable. a great thing. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes it is. Yeah. And so is it, is the way that, are, are most people that are going into vet tech specialty and clin path already working in a lab or, um, are, are they already working in a lab or like for people who are thinking about doing this is really the, it seems like the best way to get that experience is you, you really need to be working in a lab, right? I mean, to get those 3000 hours, I don't know that a question that comes up a lot is, can I do this while working in my current role as a vet tech in GP or wherever? What would you say to that? Well, yeah, you can. I mean, you have to spend X amount of time in the lab and there are certain practices. Now, we have dedicated lab staff at this practice, but there's a lot of other places that, you know, they have, you know, one time a week you're in the lab or something like that. So that might be 20, 25% of your time. The other option is if you are, are, there are tests that your clinic doesn't do, you have the option to go to another clinic and spend some time there finding out about those tests and running them there and having them sign off on it. It doesn't mean that you have to have all your tests and all your experience at the place you're working at. We've had some people switch practices in the middle of the process. And so one is signed off on, on one place and another signed off on another. We've had some people that work at a lab and teach and so um, you know, they're getting their experience that way. Uh, most of us do work in a bigger lab 
kind of setting, whether it's at a teaching hospital or it's at a animal hospital, large or smaller, but there are ways, depending where you're working, you know, you can become the, the lab guru and build up that lab practice. So there's, there's a lot of possibilities. Yeah, I see people say that a lot um, in the group, in the um, coffee house group about, you know, I'm kind of becoming the, the lab person, you know, for my practice. And um, that makes sense that, you know, you can, you can do that and you can gain those hours there, but it just might take longer if you have other responsibilities you're having to do and not able to dedicate all that time to, to that and only that. Um, do you have to have um, maintenance of your certification? Do you um, have CE requirements after you're certified? Yes, uh, every five years, your application, not your application, your certification is, re is reviewed and then re renewed. So for okay. instance, we have to do 40 hours over five years of CE, you know, X amount in person now, but you could also do things like if you are writing articles that can count for part of your professional development, or if you teach, or if you're presenting CE. So there are different ways that you can be, you know, making sure you are, are know what's going on in lab specialty, but then also professional development, just, just, you know, growing as, as mm -hmm. uh, a lab tech. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so you don't have to take the test again, just that you have the, the certification. Correct. Unless you okay. want to, if you don't want to do the CE, or the articles or teach, you have the option to take the test again. Does no one has done that. that. <laughs> uh, I was going to say, I don't know. I don't know that that would be the one I'd want to yeah. take. <laughs> no, no. You know, I studied a lot for that. Um, put my heart and soul into it. And, and I, I, no, I wouldn't want to have to take that again. So <laughs> I'm, I'm doing the CE and the other stuff and I just renewed it uh, last year. So I'm, I'm good, but uh yeah, no, don't really want to take that test again. Yeah, and for the test, if, um, it, you know, how, it's hard to quantify probably how long you studied for it because it's like you were studying basically your whole experience through just by learning and, and picking up that information. But did you have any dedicated study time, you know, that you took off or that you were oh, yeah. studying during a period of time? And, and what resources did you use? Well, so once I knew that my application was officially accepted and I had, I, I think I knew six month, months in advance when the test was going to be. So certainly during that time, I spent a lot of time going over my notes, reading the, they have several books that are resources and they don't expect you to read all of them, but um, you can read those. I read those. I took a lot of notes. And then I ended up going through my notes again, and I, I made highlighted sheets of what I thought was important that I wanted to remember so that it just helped me for studying. And I actually keep those sheets with me at the clinic because they are a nice review as far mm -hmm. as, you know, what this does or what that does. So it, it's, a, it's a nice little reference, but it's something that I went through and create it from all the books that I studied. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And then there's, there's part of, yeah, you just sort of know what you know, but there was also a lot that I reviewed and studied. I never took time off, uh, to study. I did this on my, my own, my off hours and things like that. And that's how I did that. You had mentioned, um, this just as a fellow mom, um, you had mentioned that you had children before you, pursued this. Is that right? Mm -hmm. How old were your kids? Were you yeah. This? What was that? How old were your kids while you were doing all this? And was that a challenge? A lot of people ask me things about, you know, can I do these types of things when I have kids and I don't want to get too personal. I just, I, yeah. you know, I, under, I yeah, understand that as a mom. <laughs> well, I went back to get my CVT while my kids were um, about 10 and 12. So I remember going to their soccer games and during downtime, I, I would take out a, a book and, you know, read the book or something because I was, I was in the middle of the, the CVT process. Mm -hmm. So, 
you know, they were good. They knew that mom had to study at certain times or, or I had to do this or I had to do that. So they weren't toddlers. So I will say, yeah. in my opinion, it was a little bit easier. Um, and then when, by the time I was pursuing my BTS, uh, they were already done with college and moved to different parts of the country. So gotcha. that made life easier. And my husband was really good about just, you know, letting me study and letting me panic when I needed to panic and, and stuff <laughs> like that. So yeah. um, it is doable. And like I say, you don't have to do everything in one year. You know, you submit your um, application by January 15th of, of any year. And as long as your CE was, is, is within six years and your, your um, cases are within, I think it's three years. And I should know this because I'm president of ABCPT, but I used to have everything memorized. Now it's a little fuzzy, but it is doable. It's just, you've got to, you know, you've got to be organized. You've got to plan it. And, you know, life happens, like, you know, life just happens. So, but it can be done. It can be done. It doesn't have yeah. to all be done in one year, but it can yeah. be done. Yeah. And that's, I think that's nice to hear because I think we tend to put a lot of pressure on ourselves. You know, we make goals and then it's, that goal has to be met at that certain time and get a little bit, um, the inflexibility of just allowing life to sometimes interfere as it does you know, for good or for bad, whether it's not something that unfortunate happened or, you know, you decide to have children or you, you know, something, an, an opportunity comes up that gets in the way of that goal, but you can push the goal back a little bit and you still get to have both. I think that's really good sure. advice to say, you know, don't, it doesn't have to be, you know, there, it doesn't have to be a linear route there, you know, and you're right had experience all the way up to now that I'm sure has been really valuable to what you do now. So, you know, it doesn't have to be just this boom, 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 like all in one. And life is rarely a straight line. I mean, it just <laughs> isn't, you know, right. okay. When I was, when I was in college, I thought it was going to be a straight line, but no, it's not, it, you know, it's the cutest <laughs> and things happen yeah. and you go in different directions and, you know, you pick things up and then you go back to them. So it's, mm -hmm. It's what happens, but it, it's yeah. it's doable, and you know, just keep yeah. good notes, and you know, can be done. Well, I want to ask you what. So, as far as what you do now, what are your favorite things to do in the lab? Like, uh, out of all the different tests you run, all the different things you look at, you know, do you have a particular area that you were like, if I could spend most of my time doing that, that's what I would do. Scope work, quite honestly. Um, Yay. <laughs> I, you know, honestly, I still, whenever I'm looking at anything, I'm, you know, let's say it's a, a urine cytology sample. I'm like, oh, you can really see the bacteria there. Oh, that's really cool. Not that I mm -hmm. haven't seen rods and cocks. I, how many times, but I, <laughs> I still think it's neat, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a, a lot of times that depending how crazy it is, I will just like, my staff will just sit me at the, at the, at the scope and just keep feeding me things, you know, okay, here's a pile of urine. Here's a pile of differentials. Here's the cytology. Here's this. Yeah. And I'm fine. Cause I really like it. And you know, then also because I like it, I've gotten better at it mm -hmm. a little bit faster. And so, but I, but I enjoy it. And yeah. I think that's what, I think that's what makes, um, I think there's a lot of elements to being a good educator, but I think that that's a big one where you still get excited. I mean, obviously liking what you do is a big thing, uh, but, but um, also just like being excited about things that you, that you still see commonly and being mm -hmm. willing to show that excitement to, to people that, that have never seen that. I think that, you know, as we see more and more, you know, it's natural for you not to just like want to go shout it from the rooftops that you saw, you know, rods in a urine. But at the same time, if there's somebody there that hasn't seen that before, it kind of sparks that same excitement that you, you know, you can kind of feed off that like, oh my gosh, I can't wait to show you this because I know you haven't seen it and look how cool this is. So I think that that sounds, I, I can relate to that because that's how I feel when I'm teaching um, just as just obviously things under the microscope. <laughs> 
Well, and that's, you know, two things. One, when I am teaching uh, ClinPath uh, at the school, it, you know, I do like getting enthusiastic. Well, I just am enthusiastic about it. But then I see the students also, you know, yeah. just last week, they were looking at the scope and they were seeing, you know, differentials for the first time and urine cytology slides for the first time. It's like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. And, you know, I made sure that the urine had had lots of blood and, and yeast and, and uh, bacteria in there. So there was a lot to see. Yeah. But it's like, they actually stayed late. I'm like, no, usually class is just, you know, clearing up and uh, let me get out the door as soon as possible. But they actually stayed so that they could look at these things more, which is, yeah. which to me is, makes me feel good because mm -hmm. they're obviously connecting to it. Yeah. But then, you know, the other thing too is uh, we've been getting a fair amount of heartworm positive dogs. And I want to say that uh, since Hurricane Katrina and more and more dogs have been coming up from the South, we see in, let's say six to 12 heartworm positive dogs at least a year. So whenever we find one, and it used to be, you know, one a year, if you were lucky, you, I almost shouldn't say lucky, but you know, we would find one a year, but now we're finding a whole lot more. But when we find them, you know, this, we, we sort of go around the clinic saying, hey, anybody want to see microfilaria? Because we've got microfilaria on the scope, but now you can see it. You want to see it, you know, up close and personal. So that's also a way of sharing, mm -hmm. you know, people that haven't, that normally don't work in the lab, but they can right. see what, what you're talking about, can, you know, because they're dealing with the dogs and trying to treat the dogs or, you know, dealing with the owner. Now we can say, look, you actually saw it. You know what we're talking about. Yeah. I, so yeah, that's, I totally, that's, I, nice. I, that's I'm so on, we're on the same page because that's exactly what <laughs> one of the things that get, sparks me up about cytology is it's, it's like, it's there, you know, the, I mean, we don't always get the answer with cytology, but there's no, like you're seeing it with your eyeballs. <laughs> so it's, you can, you can make that diagnosis because you're looking at it. And again, of course, that's simplifying it because there's usually, you know, additional tests sometimes that we have to do and stuff to make the final diagnosis. But the clues are there that you're looking at. So you just, it's, um, it's right. so visual and, you know, and then it's a treat when it's pretty and, you know, you get all the, the nice, like pretty cytology associated, which on another question, do you now not to put you on the spot because I was actually asked this question in a interview and I was like, how in the world I'm going to choose, do you have a favorite cell or cell type? Eosinophils. <laughs> Okay, see, that's what I said too. I, and, I mean, just bring it back and be, you know, fundamental. So, you know, I think especially horse eosinophils are just yeah. gaudy, you know? Yeah. And <laughs> yeah, I, I just think they are so cool. And then because they yeah. vary by species, and mm -hmm. because here we see so many different species, you know, I can be like, oh, well, isn't that cute? You know, on the piggy eosinophil, there's such nice little round granules. And then, yep. and then I can take this to my, to my students and be like, okay, here's a pig and here's a horse. And, and, you know, <laughs> they're just one of, they are one of my favorites. They, they just are yeah. my favorite. I will say monocytes are a close second just oh. because they can be really pretty and the, the, you know the pale blue and the and the pretty vacuoles, but the eosinophils are my favorite. They just yeah. are. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And just like you said, because they vary so much between species and like cats with their rod shaped granules, and you know they're pink, just bright pink. There's anything that's bright and not blue or purple in cytology. I think is is kind of nice. <laughs> uh, that's good. Well, yeah, yeah I'm on the I, same page with you on that. And even for my students, I've, I've snuck in um, a question every once in a while, and it'll be in a horsey of cinephil, because I really try to show them those during the, the, the course, you know, there might be a question that says, you know, this is a, an eosinophil from an animal, you know, what animal is it? Oh, you know, and, oh yeah, that's a horse. I love it. We know that. So I love, I love that question. Um, that's awesome. And I, I mean, you've already covered so much stuff about how you've gotten into, into the specialty and how you prepared and what your experience has been getting through it and, and all the way up into what you're doing now. And, um, 
I guess I have two, I probably have two, roughly two more questions um, that'll be yeah. kind of quick. Um, one would be just, you said that you, your favorite thing to do in the lab is to, is, is microscope work, but do you have like just a, like what the best part of your job is just in general? Um, I know it's kind of a broad question, but just things that you, you really enjoy about getting, getting up and going to work and um, having this particular role? I think one of the things I like is being able to provide puzzle pieces so that the doctor can make a diagnosis. So, you know, there's times we're running something and, you know, one, one of the best examples I have was an animal that came in for just an annual health exam. And we did a, a CBC chem T4 UA UPC. Well, I was working on that UA and that UPC and that UA, the glucose was extremely high. Double checked it with the, the serum chemistry glucose, which was high. And there were ketones in the urine. So this animal was, was in, a, in a bad way, but it was just a regular animal health exam. So, or annual health exam. So within, you know, like 40 minutes to an hour, I had everything done. And I, I'm telling the doctor, I said, this animal is in crisis here. And within, within an hour, because before I left, and it was, it was later at night, but the animal was back and being treated. So I like being able to give those puzzle pieces. And sometimes those puzzle pieces are just blah. You know, there, there's nothing mm -hmm. exciting about them, but there's a lot of times that, you know, the, the doctor will come in and like, I, you know, I have no idea what's wrong with this animal, you know, and then you're spinning down the serum and you're like, well, it's icteric as anything. So, okay, that's a clue <laughs> right there. And let me add mm -hmm. this test on, or I'm looking at the, the uh, differential and nothing but nucleated red blood cells. And I'm like, okay, you know, so yeah, those puzzle pieces, I, I find exciting and it makes me feel worthwhile because I'm, I just feel like I'm contributing Part to the doctor making a good diagnosis. Yeah. That's such a good way to put it because I, I, I feel that completely myself. It's just being able to, those cases that you know, that your what you did make such a huge difference in what they do and how they approach further diagnostics or at that point treatment, like that is so rewarding. Um, I just, I've, I've had cases like that where I felt the same way there where I thought, and I especially love it when the, when the doctor's kind of off on a, an, um, a road that is not the right road, which it's not that it's wrong yep. or they're just suspecting something that's not what it ends up being. And then you can go, nope, actually it's this. And, and you know that you right. made a gigantic difference in, in what happened from then forward. So that's just such a, I think that's something that probably most people in lab medicine feel. And, um, you know, we're kind of, I think lab medicine gets a little bit of a, uh, you know, we're kind of, you know, nerdy, like don't really care about anything outside of the lab, but, but that's, mm -hmm. that's the significance of what we do is that it affects the animal and, and, quality control and making sure that you are keeping up on your CE and knowing what you're doing and mm -hmm. um, being, you know, it makes a huge difference for somebody's pet at the end of the day. So, you know, that's, you know, we can, it is, it is funny though, because like you were talking about the, the conundrum of, of like the beauty in pathology and this is just, oh my gosh, this is so cool. Like, look, like you were saying, like, look at these heartworms. And then you're like, you know, you got to be careful because you don't want to go running around to the clinician saying this is so amazing because they're they're seeing you know they can handle it but you know you just want right. to be a little bit sensitive because they're seeing the other side of that and having those difficult conversations but it's the you know I try I actually try personally not to look at the name on my path report uh submissions or on my um uh, cytology submissions of the animal because uh it, even that for me is sometimes too hard <laughs> you know because I know I, I can kind of separate myself a little bit knowing you know I'm giving this terrible diagnosis in, in a lot of cases. And then I see it's like, you know, little Bubba Sparky or little, you know, <laughs> like I can see the, the pet in that, in that name. So kind of just separate a little bit, but. Um, 
Well, and, and I understand that too, because they're, I, like I said, I, I don't get out of the lab much, but occasionally, I'm a cat person. So occasionally I will walk back to the cat ward just for a short break and I'll be looking at the names and I'm like, oh, I saw your insides. Oh, I know yeah. what your blood looks like. And yeah. I saw this and, you know, so yeah. in that case, it's sort of nice to put the, the name with the, the face with the name, if you will. Yeah. But you're right. I mean, I, you know, we see a lot of animals and particularly when we're doing daily checks, you know, daily CBCs and we see, you know, the platelets just tanking or mm -hmm. some of the chemistry values, you know, just, you know, ALT, you know, 5,000 and, oh, that's coming down right. today, you know, so yeah. it's, yeah. And I guess that's, that. an, that's, I, that's I interesting understand. from your, your, your job, like in particular versus mine, because mine, I, I'm personally not seeing like follow-up type stuff. So that's interesting right. uh, perspective on your end that you're seeing these chemistries come through on these same patients and you're, you're seeing without ever sometimes seeing the animal at all, you're, you're knowing how it's doing. And, um, yeah. and, and that's actually, that's great for learning too. Cause if you are, right, and, and it's cool that you're in that hospital, cause you, if you are interested, you can go say, Hey, what are you guys doing? I'm just curious, like what, what kind of treatment or whatever is going on with this animal and, and why, you know, what, why these are trending this certain way. So just getting that follow-up is really neat. Well, I guess. It, and it is because we can. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say, because we can look on the computer or walk back and, and indeed I'll check the client file sometimes just to mm -hmm. see what's going on. You know where yeah. are they and and what's the prognosis and things like that? Yeah, I did the same thing because, like, like I said in my last job, I worked inside of a, a specialty hospital. I worked um, for a lab, but inside of a specialty hospital. And my husband is an emergency vet, and um, we worked in the same hospital. And so, you know, a lot of times he would say, you know, he would bring me samples, and I would diagnose something terrible, and then I'd walk through ICU, and he'd say, that's you know that dog, and I'd go love on him and. Um, but it's the same thing, kind of just mm -hmm. being able to be being like uh, involved. So uh, that's one of the really cool things for you and for me in that setting where that just being in that hospital setting, you can be more involved with the case and get more follow up and more information than you would necessarily be able to in a standalone diagnostic lab. And there's nothing wrong with that job, but it's it sounds like for, you know, just like you're like me, just wanting to have that more. Um, kind of involved uh, aspect of things is really fulfilling. So um, that's very cool. I, I completely relate to that. And, you know, I think as just we're wrapping up, which this has been awesome. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I've like, can't even think of any more questions, but I'm sure people that are watching this will have more questions. Um, my kind of rounded out question just to, to sum everything up and um, give people that are watching this a a little bit of sense of what they might do next. You know, do you have any, and you've given a lot of good advice on what people can do, but somebody that's interested in this, you know, a technician that's interested in this as a specialty, but, um, you know, and, and is maybe motivated by hearing you talk about it, you know, what, it, what advice would you have for them to take a next step? And you've kind of touched a lot on this, but is there anything in particular that you'd say, just in general, you know, advice for them? Well, one, uh, start getting CE that is relevant to laboratory work, whether it is specifically clinical pathology or whether it is related with disease process and things like that. And then the other part is, you know, try to get as much experience as you can. You know, if your, your hospital sends everything out, maybe say, hey, you know, can I at least start looking at differentials here? Or can we start doing some stuff in house to, just to get more experience, just to you know, even compare your results with what the reference laboratory has said and what you have in house. So there's a lot of you know, smaller steps that you can do that eventually will make one large leap and, and then you can make that. So sometimes it's just the smaller things and just they just accumulate over time. Uh, we have some students that, you know, they, they keep saying, oh, can I do this? And can I do that? Can I practice this? Can I practice that at their clinic when normally they weren't allowed to, but because now they have a little bit of experience, now they can do more. And so people are more willing to let them do that. So, 
it just little steps and it'll build yeah. up. Yeah, that's great. Just not not seeing this huge thing at the end, but but chunking it off in smaller bits and just like anything else, right? I mean, that's the way to approach most things. Uh, the I don't know if it's a Southern saying, but the, the saying of eat, how to eat an elephant one bite at a time is a terrible saying, but that's what they, <laughs> that's a, you know, it's relevant. <laughs> a journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. You know. Exactly. That's Similar much more poetic. That's much more important. <laughs> well, I, I really, really appreciate you talking with me about this. And I know everybody's going to be just feeling like this is super valuable for mm -hmm. them. There's just not a lot of opportunity for uh, people interested in this to talk to anybody that has done it before. Cause it's just not, you, like you said, it's new and it's not, a, a, there aren't a lot of you. How many people, do you know how many um, specialists there are? Um, there's about a dozen of us, including the charter members and then some people. Really? Yeah. I didn't realize yep. there was only a dozen. Wow. We need to get, we need yep. to get people in there and doing this. <laughs> well, and, and, you know, that's the thing. So we have people that have, um, so, you know, that are working on submitting applications, but you know, it takes, it takes a while sometimes. Yeah. And, and like I said, I was fortunate 3000 hours. I was like, yeah, that's not Got a it. problem at all. Cause <laughs> that's what I do right. all the, all the time. So Mm -hmm. That for me, that wasn't an issue, but you know, others, it takes a while to, to build that up. So yeah, there's not many yeah. of us and yeah. some are in um, either university hospitals or university teaching hospitals, and, and then some are in private practice. So nice. That's very cool. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, a, it sounds like it's a, it's a pretty elite club, but one that's open for others to join if you just are willing Absolutely. and able to do the work. That's cool. Well, yeah, good. well, if anybody, absolutely. if anybody has um, questions from here, is it, are you open to, you know, people emailing you or sure. getting in touch with you? Okay, cool. Sure. All right. Well, I'm, no wherever I, where, wherever this is posted, I'll make sure to include um, your email, but I don't want to just post it anywhere. So we'll, I'll, we'll figure out a way to do yeah. that. And then I'll also post the, uh, the link for the website for the application and more information on on the VTS and Killing Path. Um, but otherwise, cool. this is just this is just wonderful. So thank you so much for talking with me. This was super fun. This first little interview <laughs> in uh, this, what I hope to be a long series of just getting people's experience in this very, very cool area of vet med. So thank you very much. <laughs> Quite welcome. Thanks for having me.